Okay, so this is session five now. We're at the Advancing Genome Line Analysis. Our first, is Daniel here? Okay. <laughs> So here we have Daniel Crouch. He'll be speaking on enhanced genetic analysis of type 1 diabetes by selecting variants on both effect size and significance and by integration with autoimmune thyroid disease. I'm just going to set a timer so I look at it. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a way I can use my mouse to get on the screen. I might have to just use the pointer and um, apologies to people listening online. Um, okay, so thanks very much for the invitation to talk. I'm a postdoc in the Diabetes and Inflammation Lab at uh, Oxford. I'm just going to be giving an overview of um, a new statistical method we've developed for selecting GWAS hits on the basis of effect size as well as statistical significance and what happens when you apply that to autoimmune disease GWASs that we've done on type 1 diabetes and um, autoimmune thyroiditis. Um, so first a little bit of background on why this is important. Uh, so most of us are probably aware that uh, genetic risk for common diseases is distributed across hundreds of loci, um, all of which uh, are common variants and um, overwhelmingly very small effect sizes. But probably what's um, more concerning, what not everybody's thought about so much, is, is how this is affected as statistical power goes up. Um, so as we increase statistical power in a GWAS, a priori, one of two things could, could have happened. Uh, you could find more and more common variants with smaller and smaller effect sizes reaching genome-wide significance, or you could find variants with larger effect sizes at lower significance coming to high frequency. And what's happened in practice is overwhelmingly the former of those two things have happened, which is illustrated by this figure here. This is uh, data I, I got from a GWAS catalog for seven diseases originally studied in the, the, the big famous um, original GWAS study, WTCC. Um, and uh, what you can see is the median effect size in, in GWASs on these studies is going down going down over time, and uh, apologies to the bottom of this, the cut off just like there, I don't know why. Um, now, um, uh, what's, what's the problem with this? Well, um, now you can use, use common, these common small effect variants you can use for doing, doing various things. You can use them for prediction, you know, you can do a polygenic score, you can do a genome-wide regression or whatever, um, or you can use them for Mendelian randomization, you know, those things are all great, all well and good. But um, I don't think it's controversial to say that these small effect variants don't really point to specific, or specific biological mechanisms in a, in a, in a way that's, that's easy to establish in the way that a large effect variant can. And at least, especially on the kind of molecular level, which is the level that's important for designing drug targets and that kind of thing. And what this figure shows is that increasing sample sizes isn't really helping us in this respect. So we might, there might be some large effect variants hidden, hidden in this, uh, uh, this, you know, each of these bars here, but they're, they're very small number in comparison to all the common variants. So we're just getting sort of swamped with more and more common variants, not finding very many low frequency variants of large effects. So with this in mind, we um, developed a method for selecting GWAS hits using effect size and significance. And we, we developed this concept of the bigger or false discovery rate so this is kind of an extension of the, of the false discovery rate. And it's defined as the probability that uh, a variant is A, either a false positive, or B, it's a true positive, but that a randomly drawn true positive association, just from anywhere on the chip, exceeds it in, in effect size. So what this is doing is controlling two, two separate error rates. When you select a GWAS hit, there's two kinds of error you can make according to the VFDR. One error is that your hit is not associated with disease, it's a false positive. The other, other error is that it is associated with disease, but it's just, got, it's just got a pretty unremarkable effect size. It's just kind of consistent with the polygenic background. Um, this, is, this is called a combined error that we want to control. And you can write this, uh, this probability sort of informally here. 
Uh, so the FDR plus um, plus this additional term probability that the effect of a random non-null variant is bigger than the effect of your SNP that you're currently looking at, SNP by times by one minus the FDR. And um, so it's kind of well-established ways of estimating the FDR. I'm not going not to go into that. Um, but I'm going to talk a lot about how you estimate this probability here because it's, it's uh, not obvious how you go about doing that. Um, we do this using empirical Bayesian method. So the framework we use is Poisson regression. Um, this is sort of relatively widely used in this sort of subset of empirical Bayesian analysis. And the first step is to discretize all your z-scores for your SNPs into a histogram. So you pick a number of breaks in the histogram, maybe like default, use 100. And you uh, divide up all your z-scores in this way into a histogram. And the y-axis uh, here is, is z. So that's, um, that's essentially a measure of the significance of your SNP plus the direction of effect. Um, and then we, we fit, a, usually what you do in process regression is you fit a curve to the histogram. And the value of the curve in the middle of each bin is the Poisson parameter for the number of counts falling into that bin. In other words, it's, it's the expected number of counts in that bin. So this is a sort of GLM type method. And um, if you've got a lot of data, if you've got sort of not very much noise, like millions of SNPs, for example, that means that the, the curve, the red curve, should pretty much match up with the higher histogram in the middle of each bin. If you've got less data, it won't match exactly, but it should give the expected value in each bin. And we go a step further here by, um, by using a mixture model. Um, so instead of um, just fitting a, a sort of general model, so the red curve here, the red curve is a mixture of three distributions. Um, and one of the distributions, the, the dark blue one in this example, is the null distribution. So this is the n not one distribution of, of um, SNPs we can't distinguish from the null distribution. So they have zero effects as far as we're concerned. And then we have these two other models, which I'm going to call the lower curve and the upper curve. And these are much more flexible models. And I'll go on to how we, how we sort of fit those. Um, and because this is a mixture model, and there's a lot of flexibility in these curves. It's, it's very, very hard to fit in a, in a direct way. So we use expectation maximization, but I'm not going to go into that because it's quite detailed. Uh, OK, so these, these curves that I described on the previous slide uh, are uh, modeled by these, these first two equations. The third equation here is the, that's the null distribution. That's the blue distribution I showed you. Um, don't worry too much about the W here. That's the width of the BIM. So the null distribution is equal to 5ZB. Uh, and one distribution times by the width, that's to give you the expected proportion falling in each, uh, each of the bins. And ZB is the value of the Z score in the center of each bin. And uh, the first thing to note about um, these two curves here, the upper and the lower curve, is that they're pretty complex models. So if you set D to like, I don't know, five or six or something, um, you've got a lot of flexibility in this model. And these, these terms in the exponents, are um, they're a bit like squared polynomials. They're not quite like that, but they're a bit like that. Um, so you can do, you can fit a lot of different models with, with these curves. The second thing is that if you take the, the ratio of either of these over the null distribution, so you imagine cancelling out that W5, you're left with the exponent. You take the derivative of that ratio with respect to Z, to ZB. So you're taking the derivative of this term here with respect to ZB. That will always be positive. This is set up in a way that that derivative will always be positive, and the derivative of the the lower curve, the, the ratio of the lower curve over the null distribution, is always negative. So how does that help us? This is where things get a little bit complicated, and I apologise if I trip off in my explanation of this because it's quite hard to explain. Um, so another way of writing those ratios that I just described, the ratio of the uh, just Taking the upper curve as an example here to start with, take the ratio of the upper curve to the, the null um, distribution. That can be written as this integral here. So you get this exponent factor. This is because Z is normally distributed about X, which is its expected value. So X is the, you can think of this as the parameter we're interested in. Um, you cancel out the null distribution and you end up with this exponent. And 
uh, G here, G, G plus, is um, that's the prior distribution on the true effect sizes. And we do, we're not going to place any restrictions on, on we're not going to model um, G directly. We're not going to be sort of, um, kind of modeling the prior here. We just, we, we're just going to pretend we don't know what that is. Now, you take the derivative of the ratio, as I, as I um, said we, we did on the, um, on the previous slide, uh, this, this derivative becomes this, um, this integral here. And what you can see here is if, imagine um, x is negative here. Imagine there's a, there's a negative x in this factor here. Um, if, you, if you then take z to be negative, this exponent here gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you take z more and more negative, because z times x becomes positive, and this exponent becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So that upweights the value of this, um, this x times exponent uh, factor here. If x is positive and you take z to be negative, this factor gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So as you send z further and further towards negative infinity, this gets smaller and smaller and smaller and cancel and makes, um, makes this, this entire um, term here smaller and smaller and smaller for positive x's. Now, what that means is that you can, if there's any, um, any negative x's in here, any, any negative x's for which there's a, there's a, a prior probability of greater than zero, you can, um, you can send x, you can send z uh, further and further towards neg negative, negative infinity, make it bigger and bigger and bigger, um, negatively bigger. But it's going to cancel out all, all the positive um, all the factors here for, for positive x's and turn this entire integral negative. Right, another way of well, that formally, I've said it can now be seen that whether the, whenever the prior is bigger than zero for any negative x's, you can find a z somewhere less than zero, sufficiently negative large, that for a positive x size, you send this to be zero. And so that means that once you integrate over all the x's, this will, this will be um, negative. Some z. It might be you know, really, really far towards infinity, but you'll find it. What that means is that, so this is true if there's any negative x. So what this means is if you don't see it, if the ratio of derivative is positive for all z, you can't find this z anywhere, which this is true, then there must be no negative x's in your distribution. So your prior distribution only contains positive x values. And you can flip that logic around for the, um, for the negative distribution. So you can come up with a distribution of the negative uh, derivative of this ratio over the null everywhere, and that contains no positives. Um, I call this uh, prior splitting, and that's the name we give to the package, we call it prior splitter, which you can find on GitHub. And... Um, yeah, just to re reiterate, what, what this means now is that we've constrained the curves, so they have these constraints on the derivatives of the ratios of the null, and it means that this light blue curve here, while it might contain some observed negative z scores, so some, of the, some of the z scores are going to be negative, the true z scores, you know, the, the expected z scores for SNPs are all going to be positive, and vice versa for the, for the negative distribution. Now, once you've worked out the probability that your posterior probability that your SNP is, um, has a positive effect or a negative effect, it opens up a whole world of sort of inferential possibilities for what you can do. You've gone into sort of Bayesian world. And I'm not going to go into it, but with a bit more extra work, you can, you can use a similar method to work out which of your SNPs has um, bigger effects than other SNPs. So you take... Um, you take a SNP that you think is positive and you find out, okay, which of my SNPs has effects that are more positive than that one. You can kind of do additional stages of this analysis that allow you to do that. And this is the basis for the bigger or false discovery rate. And uh, this is how it works in simulations. I'm not really going to go into how we do the simulations. Um, you just simulate summary statistics, basically. So this method doesn't require individual level data, just summary statistics. Um, on the y-axis, you've got the the sort of true bigger or false discovery rate, um, that's, we, we can get that because we know the true effect sizes of our variance from the simulations. 
And on the y-axis is different alpha thresholds for our bigger or false discovery rate. Now what's it's showing is for every alpha threshold, the SNPs with a bigger or false discovery rate lower than the alpha have a true VFDR error rate also lower than that alpha. So we're controlling the bigger or false discovery rate here. Um, each of these gray spots is a, is a separate simulated GWAS essentially. So we simulate 100 different GWASs under different genetic architectures and it seems to control it pretty well overall. And what happens when you apply this to, to real GWAS data? So this is our type 1 diabetes GWAS with about 15,000 cases. This is the largest type 1 diabetes um, meta-analysis so far. And this is a volcano plot. These are popular in gene expression analysis. You may have seen them before. Um, the uh, x-axis is a measure of significance, uh, sorry, is uh, effect size on the x-axis on the y-axis is a measure of significance. And the blue points here are variants that satisfy an FDR of 1%, but they don't meet our BFDR of 1%, whereas the red points are the ones that, that meet a BFDR of 1%. And you can see it's sort of doing more or less what you'd expect, it's selecting outliers on, in terms of both effect size and significance. But there's also a lot of, um, quite a lot of SNPs here that have very large effect, so, effect size estimates, but they don't meet our BFDR of 1%, and that's just because they're, they're too noisy. Um, we can't, although their observed effect sizes are large, we can't, um, we can't be statistically sure that they have effect sizes that are sort of larger than the polygenic background. Now, um, because the BFDR is like an inherently stricter measure than the FDR, it's always bigger than your FDR by definition. We figure it makes sense to also um, take a more relaxed threshold um, to, in order to um, find additional things that the FDR can't find you um, with the proviso that these are going to be sort of slightly more tentative findings. We're not quite as confident about them. And if you set a threshold of 5%, you find a lot more things are coming up um, as significant. And similarly, this is our thyroiditis GWAS with about twice as many cases. You can see that a lot of the noise in the, um, the rare variants has disappeared. So consequently, um, you're kind of getting the uh, most extreme outliers on, this, on the x-axis uh, satisfying the 1% BFDR. And with 5%, you find quite a lot as well. So um, that was those volcano plots showed all the SNPs in the GWAS. This is breaking it down into independent association signals. So you do some like sort of LD clumping, and um, these Venn diagrams basically show uh, the SNPs satisfying the BFDR. Uh, in purple is the um, genome-wide SNPs. Yellow, these are these are novel SNPs. Uh, don't worry too much about that. And the green ones are the FDR SNPs. And the important thing to point out here is that um, most genome-wide SNPs don't satisfy a BFDR of 1%. If you said it's 5%, you do find some more things. Um, and you also find some things here that don't fall in the, uh, the FDR Venn diagram. We do find some novel loci. The most interesting one is RAD51D, which has a BFDR of about 1%. And we have some putative causal associations for this. Uh, it's, Main interaction part, partner is RAD51B, which is definitively type 1 diabetes associated. And these are both BRCA2 related proteins involved in cancer genome stability. Uh, I find that also quite interesting variant for ATD, which has a large effect, um, BFDR about just below three. And also there's um, putative causal variants here that map to um, the boundary of an enhancer element. I should point out that fine mapping these variants is challenging so there's nearly all of the variants we find this way um, you can't really find map very well but these ones we find some sort of borderline causal associations uh, and i'll just end up by, by um, mentioning that um, for the atd gwas which is the more highly powered gwas 41 percent of the sort of lenient bfdr signals these are the ones that have a bfdr five percent but they they don't meet a fdr of one percent 41% of those have lead variants that are either non-coding transcripts or regulatory reasons, which means they're sort of possibly putative, putative causal variants themselves. And uh, I'll just leave it there. And thanks to all my co-authors and the study participants. Thanks. Thanks.
can't hear. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Very interesting. Um, the method seems to rely on a split of positive and negative effect sizes, which is a rather arbitrary choice about which is your effect allele. How was that choice made? And is the method robust to arbitrary large scale swapping of effect allele? That's a really good question. Um, I define the effect size in terms of the minor allele. Um, I haven't, haven't sort of tested what happens if you swap it around randomly, but um, the method can cope with asymmetrical distributions. So where you have completely different distribution above zero to below zero. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks. I'll try to keep the time. Our next speaker is Guillermo Rios from University of Cambridge. He's speaking on genetic feature engineering using blood cell traits to assess the differential genetic architecture of immune mediated diseases. Okay, hello, good morning. Uh, well, uh, for the introduction and thanks all the organizers for organizing this uh, lovely um, conference and also for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, as Jen said, I'm Guillermo Reales. I'm a postdoc at Chris Wallace Group here at the Department of Medicine in Cambridge. And I'm gonna talk to you uh, today about uh, one of the projects that we're working on at the lab in which we apply genetic features engineering using blood cell traits to assess the differential genetic architecture of immune diseases. So let's see what's this all about. Um, so immune diseases, as you uh, probably most of you already know, uh, are a set of multifactorial uh, diseases characterized by aber aberrant immune responses that leads to chronic uh, inflammation and tissue destruction. It affects roughly 8% of the population worldwide with uh, differences between sexes and also among different population. Uh, many of them share biological mechanisms, even if they affect different tissues. And most importantly for us today, uh, many of them share a genetic, well, they have a genetic component. They tend to cluster in families and they can also co-occur in the same individuals. As an example, th uh, three to 16% of people with type one diabetes also celiac disease. And by analyzing um, the genetic architectures of these diseases uh, per ways, it was um, soon evident that many of these diseases also shared uh, risk alleles, just like these two jigsaw pieces share uh, a bit of cream. Okay. Okay, so, but what if we want to see the larger picture and we want to move um, beyond comparing uh, diseases. Well, we believe that there are um, benefits in uh, looking at many diseases at the, at the same time. So we can, for example, identify uh, shared mechanisms that can help in therapeutic repurposing and also for co uh, contraindications and side effects. And probably most importantly, we can leverage information from more common IMDs uh, to characterize uh, rare uh, traits in which uh, they don't have sample size big enough to have enough power to for discovery on their own. So to reap these benefits, we must move for pairways from beyond pairways comparisons. But of course, if you have uh, thousands uh, or millions of uh, genetic variants and um, many different traits, you'll soon uh, run into trouble because of the high dimensionality of the of the data. And in this work, we address uh, this particular issue. So I was going to give a brief note on, on US, but I think uh, by now you already know pretty much about US. So I don't need to spend very long on this. But uh, the point I wanted to make uh, with, this, with this slide is that, yeah, US um, ex experienced a boom on the past few years since they started in uh, 2002. And this has resulted in uh, 
tens of thousands of studies that have identified uh, millions of associations. And this is a picture from the US catalog, and this is just one chromosome, and you can see here uh, the identified association, and they are colored by the kind of trait. This is just a small sample, because of course the US catalog don't have, doesn't have all the GWAS that are out there. So um, lots of data, increasingly easy to access, which is nice, but also lots of dimensions to deal with. So. Let's go for the method. Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. So uh, we develop a method to study to study shared genetic uh, risks across many diseases at the same time. Uh, we published this in Warren and colleagues in 2020. Uh, so in that work, basically, we uh, took data from the effect size from GWA summary statistics of 13 clinically related IMDs. And then we combine a, a PCA with a Bayesian lens that allowed us to focus on the variants that are more likely to be causal for these particular diseases. So essentially, what we did, we computed the posterior uh, probability for uh, each specific variant to be causal um, using the, the basic assumption that most of the variants won't be causal, and then we use this posterior probability to shrink the effect sizes. So at the end, we have most of the SNPs with effect size uh, effectively zero and a matrix that is nearly sparse. So once we do this and plus PCA, we have a multi-dimensional, reduced dimensional space, which I will refer from now on as the basis. Uh, and this basis uh, can uh, capture much of the GWAS signal selected traits, uh, and also summarizes the main axis of genetic risk. So after we do that, we can project independent uh, GWAS uh, datasets uh, on, on, onto the basis, um, and then we expect that different traits will show uh, different spectra across the, the components, and then to call significance, uh, we made a, a um, statistical test uh, comparing the, the projection value to a uh, null GWAS uh, con control. Um, okay, so this allowed us to uh, examine uh, independent GWAS uh, data sets in a reduced and man manageable uh, number of dimensions. Okay, so from, from this previous work, it was um, uh, it was not uh, remarkable that some of the features uh, were associated with uh, blood cell counts, and of course we know we all know about the importance that uh, blood cells has in immune uh, responses. So we wonder whether we could uh, just build a new basis using blood cell traits and then find out more about uh, disease. So we did exactly that. We used data from uh, Asel and colleague from uh, 2016, and then we constructed a blood cell basis, uh, well, which uh, they give us three uh, blood cell counts and related measure, 33, sorry, 36 blood cell counts and related measurements on uh, 170,000 healthy Europeans from uh, UK Biobank and Interval Consortium. So uh, we use this data to build a new basis and then I'll show you some of the results. So the first thing is to validate the method. So uh, we um, use data from Chen uh, and, and colleagues from 2020, which basically uh, run US on the same or similar traits to ASL, but in multiple different ancestries. Uh, and this is very nice because this allowed us to see how the basis reconstructed the genetic architecture of these diseases and also across different ancestry. Um, so we represent this in, in this heat map. So you have traits on rows, features on the columns, and then the dots indicate whether the particular um, trait was significant and FDR 1% or 5% for a specific uh, feature. So as, as you can see here, uh, the basis correctly reconstruct the genetic architecture of these traits uh, because as you, as you can see 
similar traits group to cluster together. And also, uh, uh, even though when they are come from, from different ancestries, so this shows that the basis is robust to different technical, uh, yeah, to technical differences and also LD differences. Okay, this is very nice, but what about the other traits? So we created, a, we collected around 6,000 to 7,000 GWAS summary statistics. We harmonized them and then we applied, yeah, quality control, exclude redundant traits, and also exclude uh, those we had from, from UK Biobank, because of course we use uh, data from, uh, from a study that used UK Biobank individuals, and we wanted to get as many uh, independent uh, data sets as, as possible. So after doing this, after filtering, uh, well, we also classified the data in, in categories, and we have over uh, 3,500 uh, data sets. Uh, most of them were classified as other, just not uh, IMDs, not cancer, not infections, and not biomarkers, etc. But when we uh, project this data and apply a significance threshold of FDR 1%, we see that first, like most of the data sets are not significant, and then the distribution of them changes radically. So now we see that the other is uh, greatly reduced. We see that most of the significant traits are either biomarker and immune or IMDs. And indeed, if we compare um, uh, and, and if we compute the, the, the odds ratio, we see that uh, the odds ratio for a biomarker trait. Uh, to be significant or uh, AMD to be significant is uh, almost eight fold and tenfold and rich compared to being an other trait, which um, shows how this uh, how our bases basically capture uh, immune related signals from the uh, uh, biomarkers represented by the biomarkers and IMD data sets that we have here. Okay. Uh, Another important thing, uh, this, uh, all the features can also be uh, individually uh, characterized. And I will show you two examples uh, that gather most of the significant data sets uh, from the basis. And we also found them specifically, yeah, especially interesting. So one is PC5, which seems to uh, uh, split a neosinophilic signal characterized by eosinophil count on this side. And then a platelet and lymphocyte signal here on the other side. And then on the, on the eosinophil side, we see several significant uh, biomarkers. There are other, but like uh, we see, for example, the eosinophil cationic protein associated with uh, eosinophils. So eosinophilic cationic protein is uh, one of the main proteins that are released during eosinophil degranulation, so it makes sense. Also, papillacin 1, which is an insulin uh, like growth factor modulator involved in pregnancy and wound healing, among other processes. Then, on the other side, we find uh, soluble ST2, which uh, participates in immunoregulation uh, as a decoy receptor for interleukin 33, and also is negatively associated with, with asthma severity. So, and it appears on the other side that asthma, which I will get in, in a bit. Uh, so it kind of makes intuitive sense. Regarding IMDs, um, multiple uh, IMDs are significant for this uh, component, especially on the eosinophilic side. Um, some of them are supported by the literature, like uh, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, nasal polyps, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, are well known to be associated with uh, eosinophilic uh, levels, also allergic conditions, but also we find uh, some potentially novel eosinophil associations such as vitiligo, autoimmune uh, thyroid disease, and childhood arthritis. Then moving on to PC8, PC8 cap seems to capture a common signal of eosinophils, platelets, lymphocytes, and for, for this um, component, for this feature, we see uh, several uh, eosinophil related IMDs such as uh, asthma, nasal polyp and type 1 diabetes, just like before, but also others like primary biliary uh, uh, cholangitis and primary sclerosis cholangitis and also multiple sclerosis, which might represent a lymphocyte or platelet signal. It's still investigating it. 
also many pro-inflammatory and angiogenic uh, cytokines and factors, and also anti-inflammatory factors. Uh, and perhaps interestingly, on the platelet side, on the platelet, eosinophil, and lymphocyte growth side, uh, we found at the very extreme, as you can see here, uh, two myeloproliferative traits, one of them thrombocytemia, so you know there are uh, blood cancers that are characterized by elevated levels of blood cells, and in the case of thrombocytemia, they are platelets. So it kind of makes intuitive sense that it appears together with platelet counts. Then um, we can uh, look at both uh, features together to try to distinguish those signals. So we did uh, exactly that. So you, you can see here uh, PC5 on the vertical, and then PC8 on the horizontal, and then you see using fills, lymphocytes, and platelets, and then you see the distribution of the of the projection. Uh, we also clustered the traits uh, using uh, DBMAN, which is a, a clustering method developed by. Uh, my colleague Kat Nichols, um, which is a clustering method that takes into account the, the uncertainty uh, around the estimates. So, but using this method, uh, we see that uh, green cluster and purple cluster capture mainly uh, eosinophilic signal. They seem to uh, blue the blue cluster, which are the two um, myeloproliferative diseases, basically platelet and lymphocyte signal. Uh, then the orange cluster seem to capture a um, kind of common yet weak signal, and then the gray uh, basically uh, lymphocyte and platelet or nil. So we also develop an online tool. It's not as uh, beautiful as uh, things from yesterday, but we're still working on improving it. So the good thing is that if you work with uh, GWAS summary statistics, you can play around with it. So you can upload your, your own data. It's, uh, hopefully uh, well documented enough, and you can see how your trait falls in each of the features of the basis. So you might find this useful. So in conclusion, uh, we extended uh, our method to summarize axis of shared genetic risk across clinically related diseases using GWARS summary statistics in a blood cell context. Uh, the blood cell basis uh, captures blood cell signal, obviously, and is robust to ancestry. And it also recovers uh, known and potentially new associations uh, for uh, AMDs with blood cells and cytokines. Uh, this work is an, just a brief introduction to, 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 to this work, but we're still um, working on component or feature interpretation. But we hope that uh, with all the richness of data that we have using this method, we can transform part of that data into knowledge. And finally, we have. Uh, or two, which is uh, freely available if you, in case you, you want to play with it. And then I want to thank uh, Chris, Oli Burren, uh, Kath, and, and also all the researchers who share summary statistics, because for you in the field, you know, this is a, an issue. So please, if you work with uh, doing GWAS, please share your summary statistics. And I'll leave it here, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, I was just thinking a, a kind of a more naive way of getting at some of the same questions would be to just take the um, some of the blood measures. So say it's, it's in a full count and build a, um, a score for that and then do a Mendelian randomization type analysis against your immune related diseases or other diseases. I mean, have you got a sense of the pros and cons of doing that relative to your slightly more sophisticated approach here? Uh, well, yeah, to, to be honest, we haven't uh, considered that method, but like, it might be an interesting thing to test. I, I'd, be, I'd be quite intrigued in whether you find the same things, slightly different things, how you interpret the results. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. Uh, just along the same lines of the dimension reduction type thing, how easy would it be to scale it up if you want to look instead of 36 blood cell traits, if you want to look at 100 metabolites or something like that, like just have a different basis to form it? How easy would it be to scale to a different set of traits? I think I think it would be I think it would be pretty easy. Uh, yeah, once once we have uh, 
uh, or, or method defined to uh, build a new basis. Just using a different set of traits should be uh, relatively trivial. Our next speaker is online. Uh, so, so the spot. Be getting help. <laughs> uh, so it's Irandi Robertson from Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research, speaking on a hidden mark of model to identify inherited disease causing variants using shared genetic markers. Um, thank you for the introduction. Could someone please confirm if my screen sharing is visible? Yes, we can see your slides. Okay. Full screen. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, so today, during the talk, I'll be taking you through a, a bioinformatic tool that we developed to detect individuals with rare disease variants using snp -tip data. Um, a good portion of genetic diseases are inherited. Here you can see how multiple generations are affected with diseases like Huntington's, BAME1, cystic fibrosis, or hemophilia. Um, over the years, by analyzing multiple families affected with the same genetic disorder, it was um, found out that um, affected individuals in multiple families, multiple unrelated families, share a common haplotype around the um, disease variant. Um, such instances are often associated with founder effects where the disease variant is believed to have originated from. Um, so this figure shows how individuals who have inherited um, disease variants uh, shown here in red from a common founder also share a cohaplotype shown in blue here. The size of the cohaplotype is different among affected individuals and gradually decreases with time due to recombination. Um, after generations, um, when you take up to distantly related individuals who had inherited the same disease variant from a common founder, we can witness a fragment of the original disease haplotype that's common to these two individuals and that had not gone through recombination. Such segments are known as IBD or identity by descent segments. Um, so the fact that affected individuals in present share fragments of the original disease haplotype shows that we can predict individuals with disease variants by inferring if they have inherited known disease causing haplotypes. Um, these are some examples of founder effects. There are literally hundreds of founder effects across um, different genetic diseases where our research idea can be applied. Um, disease variants in general have been identified using whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing data. Um, WES is a couple of hundred dollars per person for 200 fold coverage, and WGS is even more expensive. On the other hand, the predominant data type in public databases would be SNP chip data. There are hundreds and thousands of individuals with SNP chip data, with only SNP chip data in public repositories. However, rare variants may not be captured on SNP chip. In such cases, these missing variants can be imputed using imputation algorithms and platforms forms such as Michigan server or TopMed server. Um, unfortunately, the imputation accuracy is known to be low when imputing rare variants. Um, since we know WGS is anywhere expensive, how can we detect variants that cannot be whole exome sequenced because they are not on coding regions and um, not on SNP chip as well because they are rare and again hard to be imputed accurately simply because they are rare again. Um, here we propose our tool found haplo. Uh, that uses SNP chip data that's commonly available to predict individuals with rare disease variants with an increased accuracy by leveraging on known disease haplotypes. Here, the usage of SNP chip data makes this tool widely applicable, and we hope uh, many individuals will be able to get the benefit out of it. Um, now, I'll take you through how the predictions are done in our algorithm. Um, let's say this is a known disease causing haplotype with a particular disease variant. And if we want to test if another individual has the same disease variant, we take one haplotype at the time of that individual and compare the alleles in the neighborhood to the left and right uh, of the disease, var disease variant um, locus to that of the known disease causing haplotype. 
um, the test individual haplotype alleles could be a poor match or it could be a very good match as shown in this example. Um, this allele uh, matching or sharing could happen by chance or as a result of identity by descent, where the two haplotypes are inherited from a common founder, and that is what we are interested in. Um, based on the alleles that we observe, now we are going to determine the IBD status in the neighborhood using a hidden Markov model. One thing to point in here is that the algorithm does not observe the alleles at the disease variant locus, but rather the neighborhood. Um, in our Markov model, the two um, hidden states would be IBD or non-IBD as we travel through the Markov chain to the left and right. If the Markov chain is already at a marker that is non-IBD, the next marker cannot be IBD because the recombination has already happened. If the chain is at a marker that is IBD, the next marker could be non-IBD uh, with the probability of recombination happening between the two uh, markers. Uh, taken as R. Um, these are the transition probabilities uh, between the hidden states in the Markov model. Uh, the observed alleles between the disease and the test haplotypes could be any of these four possibilities. Again, the corresponding SNPs could be IBD or non-IBD as I've explained, explained before. Um, under the null hypothesis, we assume or we consider that the neighborhood around the disease variant is not IBD. And therefore, in the Markov chain, we have to only consider um, when the hidden status is non-IBD. The probability of observing alleles given the corresponding SNPs are non-IBD can also be um, taken as probability of these alleles occurring independently on both haplotypes taken as a function of A, which is the minor allele frequency. Um, under the alternate hypothesis, we consider that the test, uh, the neighborhood around the disease variant is IBD. However, um, recombination is bound to happen at one point. We just do not know in advance when that happens. Therefore, under the alternate hypothesis, the hidden status could be IBD or non-IBD. A marker cannot be IBD if the corresponding alleles are different on the disease and the test haplotypes. Um, when the alleles are the same, the respective common allele is taken to have um, occurred once uh, due to both disease and test haplotype having a common ancestor under the alternate hypothesis. Um, up to this, I've shown you the or explained you the baseline of the hidden Markov model in the algorithm. Uh, however, found haplo is designed to accommodate genotype and imputation errors of up to 1% and facing errors on the test individuals as well. Um, that is, however, extra layers of complications adding into the model, which I'm not going to explain now. Um, in the model, we have calculated, we've done the predictions based on a log likelihood ratio as shown in here, and endpoints of the Markov chain are L and R to the left and right respectively. The endpoints are calculated based on allowing certain degree of allele mismatches to represent genotype and imputation errors. And this threshold is derived using um, simulations. Um, the test statistic here is the found haplo score or the HFE score as shown in here, which is a measure of log likelihood ratio. We reject the null hypothesis if our score is greater than or equals to a predetermined um, critical value, which I'll be coming back to in later slides. Rejecting the null hypothesis implies that the two haplotypes are distantly related, and as a result, the respective test haplotype has also inherited the disease variant of interest. Um, here when running found haplo, disease haplotypes are created using known disease individuals when at least one parent of the disease sample also has um, genotype data available to prevent switch errors or facing errors being introduced in the disease individuals. Um, the most um, simple scenario in running found haplo is when you need to test one um, individual using only one disease haplotype. In that case, the first input would be the known disease haplotypes faced using trio, duo, or pedigree data. And the second input is the haplotypes of the individuals to be tested faced using traditional facing tools. Um, the found haplo will output the HFE score for that um, test individual. A relatively complex scenario is when you need 
to test multiple test individuals across multiple disease haplotypes. In that case, found haplo will output the heftier score for each test disease pair as it did before, and also a combined score for each test sample across all the disease haplotypes for a single variant of interest. Um, this combined score is still a work in progress. However, we believe that the combined score is capable of giving more power in the model because it leverages on multiple disease haplotypes. Um, that means the more disease haplotypes we have, the better, especially when the disease variants are associated with multiple founder effects. Um, after developing the mathematical framework, we wanted to evaluate uh, the algorithm using a comprehensive simulation study. We used the um, haplotypes of the European cohort in Thousand Genomes Project in our simulations. Um, here, distant relatedness was simulated by slicing in a genomic regions of different sizes around a selected disease variant locus between a randomly selected disease haplotype and test haplotypes, five test haplotypes, which are going to be our cases in the simulations. The splicing in region is taken to be 0.5, 1, 2, and 5 in centimorgans, respectively, to um, represent oldest to the youngest simulated most recent common ancestors. After this step, we added 1% of genotype and imputation errors, and also phasing errors into the simulations to reflect real data. Um, simulations were done across 28 known repeat expansion diseases. Um, repeat expansions are of great interest to our lab, and they are often inherited and show strong founder effects, and therefore they are an excellent set of candidate disease variants to evaluate the performance of our algorithm. Um, this plot shows the simulate results across all the diseases that we simulated. Um, the simulated cases, the colored box plots you can see here, show higher hefe score values than the controls, which are the black box plots. And you can see that um, our statistic is capable of differentiating cases from controls by giving higher hefe score values. Another thing you would notice here is that controls to share uh, some extent with the disease haplotypes, even though we did not um, simulate them to share. This is because of um, linkage dis disequilibrium. A portion of controls or general population could share known disease haplotypes to some extent. However, we expect this to be very minimum. Um, in this next plot, uh, it shows the proportion of simulated cases that pass the 99th percentile of the 1000 genome controls. On the y-axis, you have the proportion and the x-axis, the simulated sharing window. If we take this 99th percentile as the critical value in doing our predictions, you can see that found HAPO correctly predicted 90% of simulated samples on average sharing a region of at least one centimorgan and 100% of samples sharing two centimorgan or more. And that is a pretty good sensitivity. And you will also notice that all these disease variants converge to 100% as the simulated sharing window increases. That means when simulated cases and diseases are more closely related to um, each other. Um, after getting satisfactory results in the simulations, we applied our algorithm to predict individuals with a rare um, epilepsy variant. Um, here, the variant of interest causes genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus, which is an autosomal dominant um, epilepsy syndrome. Um, we are interested in a rare point mutation in gene SCN1B. Uh, here, the disease allele is GA as highlighted in here. We have SNP chip data for nine unrelated families uh, with 100 samples. Out of that, 31 samples were identified to have the variant using Sanger sequencing or whole exome sequencing data. Um, all the affected samples in these nine families shared a core haplotype of half a centimorgan around the disease variant, as you can see in this figure, suggesting a single founder effect for all these affected samples. The distant common ancestor was calculated to have occurred approximately 27 generations ago. Um, this core haplotype was found to be present in one to one and a half percent of European populations based on thousand genomes data. Um, now, we did a blind analysis to see if our algorithm is capable of picking these 31 samples. So in the first step, we created five guess plus disease haplotypes using trio or duo data from the 31 affected samples. 
And this plot shows the combined score values of all the 100 samples. The samples known to have the variant are shown here in red. And the black violin plot is the combined HFPS score of the 1000 genome controls using which we derive the critical value of 99th percentile shown here with a purple horizontal line. Um, this table is a classification matrix. Here you can see that uh, the algorithm was able to predict all 31 samples as carrying the variant, which is 100% sensitivity and very high specificity too. However, found helpful, that five samples without the variant as carrying as having as sharing the disease haplotype. As I said before, a portion of the general population could anyway share known disease haplotypes to some extent, and we believe that is what being picked by the model in here. Um, in the next application, we analyzed the UK Balbank cohort for the same YAXPAS variant. We had yeah. imputed data and West data for 200,000 samples. And out of that, we found out 74 samples have this uh, GEFS plus variant. Um, however, only one sample was imputed to have this variance based on imputed SNP chip data. Um, this again comes down to the fact that traditional imputation tools are not very reliable in imputing rare variants. Now we wanted to see if our algorithm is capable of predicting these 74 samples. Um, so we've, we've created haplotypes using shape before of all these 200,000 samples, and we used the same five guess plus disease haplotypes that we used before to run found haplo on these samples. Um, so this plot is pretty similar to the plot that I showed you previously. The only difference is that now the 99th percentile critical value is calculated using the UK Biobank cohort itself. Here the idea is that when you have such a massive cohort, the positive cases will anyway come at the top or at the right tail of the distribution and you would not need a separate control cohort to do your predictions. Um, based on the classification table, you can see that the algorithm was able to predict 71 samples correctly as carrying the variant, giving high sensitivity and specificity. Um, even though the incorrect classification of samples without the variant as carrying the variant is um, less than 1%, since this is such a massive cohort, we are still getting around 2,000 samples. Now, that's a lot of samples. Between. Now, we need to get this down from 2,000 by making the cutoff value more strict. Um, we used to receive operating curves to identify the best um, critical value or the cutoff value. And that turned out to be the 99.95 percentile shown here with the purple um, dashed line. With this new cutoff value, we are still getting 80% of the samples correctly predicted as having the variant, still a pretty good sensitivity. And now the incorrect classification of uh, samples uh, without the variant predicted as carrying the variant is um, very low and it has gone down from a very high number from the previous critical value. And this is such a small number of incorrect classification for such a big cohort. And when you compare the accuracy of found haplo with the UK Bar Bank traditional imputation accuracy, you can see found haplo gives much better gain uh, than the traditional imputation by leveraging on known disease haplotypes. Um, so these two applications in summary shows that found haplo is an efficient test statistic in um, predicting individuals with um, known disease variants. Um, so in future, in the same way, we plan to apply uh, this tool to large SNP data repositories to identify individuals that carry known um, disease causing haplotypes. Um, with that, I would like to thank each and everyone who contributed to this research and thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, uh, I was wondering for the UK Biobank example, so the individuals that have the pathogenic variant, did you also look at um, the phenotypes, if they have a clinical diagnosis or something that points towards the fact that they're affected, and like which percentage has that? Yeah, we are in the process of checking that. We are actually uh, uh, writing a manuscript to publish the UK Biobank results. We have, I would say, so far identified around five to six samples that has 
uh, similar phenotypic um, uh, thing, uh, but we haven't checked all the samples yet. So I'm unable to give a percentage as such. And just related on that, because this variant is known, so do you know the penetrance of it? The like penetrance is around 80, 70 to 80 percent. Okay, so you would expect more people that have uh, gone to the doctor with some symptoms. Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't get to you. So probably you will find more people in the UK Biobank that have a clinical diagnosis. Yes, we have found a few, but we haven't checked all of them yet. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we have a question on Zoom from Fabian. Fabian, would you like to unmute and say your question? Uh, yes, thank you for, for the nice talk. Uh, I was wondering what are the differences between your HMM uh, algorithm and uh, the results uh, derived from other uh, EBD sharing, uh, segment sharing algorithm as uh, Refine EBD, Refine IBD, uh, IBD LD or, uh, or King, for example. Yes, um, the main difference, because there, there have been many IBD segment uh, detection algorithms developed, like Refine IBD, plus IBD, etc. They all, in general, um, try to find IBD segments throughout the genome, and they do not have prior knowledge of known disease haplotypes. The main difference in our algorithm is that we do not scan the entire genome. When we want to test for a particular disease variant, we just take a neighborhood, let's say, Morgan or something around the disease variant, and we run the hidden marker because the IBD sharing of that variant would have ended after some time. So, no point in checking the entire genome. And we use prior knowledge of known disease haplotypes. So, I would say that's the main difference between the other IBD algorithms and this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's go on to the next last speaker in the session. Uh, this is Taki Barandu from Aarhus University, speaking about LDAC GBAT, a powerful and efficient tool for gene-based analysis of GWAS data. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the presentation and the introduction, and I would uh, like to thank the EMGM organizer for giving me the opportunity to present our recent work. This presentation is focusing on describing LDAC GBAT, a new tool of gene-based association analysis. Let's begin with some context. Genome-wide association studies, GWAS, in which hundreds of thousands to millions of genetic variants across genomes of many individuals are tested to identify genotype phenotype association. Over the past decades, GWAS ha have led to insight into architecture of disease susceptibility and to advance in cl clinical and personalized medicine. However, despite the clear success of GWAS, the study design has, has not been without limitation. A major limitation of GWAS is the need to adopt a high level of significance to account for the multiple tests problematic. Strategy to overcome the limitation of testing or multiple testing in GWAS exists. One strategy is to increase the sample size. However, assembling large sample sizes is not always possible. A second strategy is to reduce the number of performance tests. This can be achieved by using, for example, using gene-based association tests which come with some benefits, including reducing number of tests from millions of tests to only tens of thousands of tests. And also, it considers the heterogeneity in gene and gives a direct gene level interpretation. In the following slide, I'm presenting an overview of the major gene-based association analysis tools that exist up, up to date. We distinguish tools according to the type of data a tool can use. First, we have raw data, which mean individual level genotyping and phenotypes, or summary statistic, combined or not, with a individual 
genotyping level data from a reference panel. Also, we can distinguish method according to st the statistical tests applied. Now, we move on to uh, describe LDAG GBAT. Here in the next two slides, I will explain briefly how LDAG GBAT tests a gene phenotype association. Considering a gene as a window, including mSNPs, LDAG GBAT assumes the linear model described in equation one, with betas the effect sizes for the SNPs, and the E is the environmental noise. We assign the following prior distribution to beta j's and E as described in equations two, where the sigma square g and sigma square e denote the genetic and environmental variance components, and the qg's are the pre-specified constant determined by the choice of the heritability model. So now I, I will give a small words about the heritability model. When analyzing SNP data, the expected heritability, uh, the heritability model describes how the expected heritability contributed by a SNP vary across the genome. So with SNP standardized, the expected heritability is proportional to the expected beta j square which is in turn proportional to QJ as uh, denoted in the preced precedent equation. So that means that the value of QGs determine the heritability model. So if we set alpha to minus one, so QG will equal to one for all SNP, then LDAG GBAT will assume that all SNP contribute equally to, to heritability. We refer to this model as the uniform heritability model and it is the same model used by another uh, gene-based association tool, which is fast LMM set. Our previous works indicate that the uniform, uniform heritability model is suboptimal because when analyzing real data, we observe that uh, heritability systematically change with the features such as minor alpha frequency and the LD structure. So, we propose alternative models by setting, for example, alpha to minus uh, 0 0.25, and we call this uh, the human default model for our LDAG GBAT, and also by considering functional annotation. For example, if we consider uh, if a SNP uh, belong to EQTL or conserve region, we can uh, <clears throat> uh, assign uh, weight to those SNP according to this model. Then from equation one and two uh, presented in the previous slide, we can define the likelihood equation as in the equation three. By using Woodbury inverse lemma and Sylvester's determinant theorem, we can rewrite some of the parts of this equation, the principally the, 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 the inverse of the variance and the determinant of the, va the variance. So this give us uh, the final form of the equation as written in equation four. And this form allow us to use summary statistic data instead of individual level data. Then we use for LDAG GBAT to estimate the, the genetic comp uh, and environment component variance by using average information restricted maximum likelihood. Then we use a likelihood ratio test to test whether the, gen the genetic variance component is greater than zero. And like fast LMM sets, uh, LDAG GBAT use uh, and derive the null distribution of the alert statistic test from a permutation uh, procedure. Through this two slide, we, sh uh, we show that LDAG GBAT extend fast LMM set in two K ways. Firstly, LDAG GBAT can use summary statistic data, where, where is fast LMM set require individual level data. And secondly, LDAG GBAT can accommodate alternative heritability models, where is fast LMM set assume that all SNP are expected to contribute equal, equally to the heritability. So next, we evaluated the result concordance between fast LMM set and LDAG GBAT when assuming a uniform heritability model. For that, we used uh, real data from Yucca Biobank 
for 14 traits such as BMI, systolic blood pressure and height, etc. Then we analyze this data with both tools for individual level data and compare the following parameters, the heritability estimation, the alternative like log likelihood, and the alerted test statistic and the obtained p-value from the permutation procedure. We found that the results from LDAC GBAT are nearly identical to those from fast LMM sets. For example, for height, we see that for heritability estimation or LRT statistic or the p-value, almost all points lie on the diagonal. And across the 14 traits, we found that the correlation was equal to one for all the parameters estimated. However, LDAC GBAT is at least 15 times faster than fast LMM set and use three, three times less memory uh, uh, for, uh, for calculation. Tool that use summary statistic, it need a reference panel to calculate the SNP, SNP correlation. So we evaluated the impact of reference panel on the choice of on uh, on the uh, of the choice of the reference panel on LDAC GBAT performance. To do so, we compare the results when using summary statistic and the reference panel with the results when using individual level data that we consider our gold standard. We tested four reference panel from using 10,000 uh, individual from UK Biobank or 400 uh, individual from or 400 European from the 1,000 project, uh, 1,000 genome project, or the UK 10, UK 10K uh, reference panel. Again, here the, the plots show for height uh, on the left, show result obtained uh, comparing the, the p-value on the top and the LRT statistic on the bottom. We see a good concordance between results from analyzing individual data on the x-axis or the summary statistic on the y-axis. And the bar plots on the right shows that we have a high correlation for all the parameters are above 97%. So that means that our results obtained from using summary statistics are equivalent to results obtained from analyzing individual level data and are robust to the choice of the reference panel. And that GBAT can assume different uh, heritability model as shown in uh, previously. So including the basic uniform model or model considering the, the impact of minor RL frequency that we call the human default or more complex considering functional annotations such as UQTL and conserved region. So we tested the impact of the heritability mode choice on the power of gene detection of LDAC GBAT. The following figures show that the average of significant gene detected across the 14 UK biobank trade that are uh, uh, described previously for each heritability model. We see, we observe clearly that when assuming the uniform model, the power decreased. However, when considering the human default or a more complex heritability model, we obtain equivalent gene power detection. So for this, our recommendation is to use the human default model as it does not require to pre-calculate the weights for all SNP before running the gene-based analysis. We saw that many tools exist for gene-based analysis. So we benchmarked our LDAC GBAT with other tools that use summary statistic too. And we used, and they, that this method used different statistical model to infer the gene phenotype association. So first we assess the type one error using 1000 simulated traits obtained from permuting UK Biobank height phenotype. Then we generated summary statistic for this simulated trait and used the different gene-based tool, such as Magma, FastBat, and the method implemented in a, a package called SamFrigate, uh, which, which adapted method uh, known for individual level data like uh, principal common component analysis or multiple linear or functional linear regression or SCATO. So this table show the type one error rates for each method at different threshold. We see that all methods are well calibrated at 5% and 1% threshold. However, at the Pomferino threshold, that means 5% divided by the number of the tested gene, all methods remain calibrated except for MLR and FLM. 
from the package some frigate, which show inflate false positive, positive rates. Also, using the real data from 14 UCA bioent trade described previously and four different reference panels, we compared the computational efficiency and the gene detection power. And limited, we, we excluded the MLF as they showed uh, false positive uh, inflation. So the figure on this slide report the average running time to analyze each of the 14 UCA bank phenotype using one CPU and eight gigabyte of memory. We see that LDAG bad, Magma, and FastBad are the three fastest tools. On average, these tools takes less than two minutes to analyze each phenotype, which is at least 10 times faster than SCATO or PCA or ACAT that are implemented in some frigate package. To be noted, that this package, some, some frigate, requests an extra step in which SNP-SNP correlation matrix is calculated for each gene and co the computing time for this step is not represented in the plot. Next slide summarizes the gene detection power. The following bar plot shows the average of detected significant gene at the Bonferroni threshold across, across the 14 UK bank trade for each method. And for each reference panel, we see that LDAG GBAT has the highest power, finding on average 14% more significant gene than PTA, 22% more than ACAT, and 30% more significant gene than MAGMA. We wanted to apply LDAG GBAT and extend the comparison to other uh, summary statistics outside the UK Biobank. So we analyzed. Uh, used uh, 18 available summary statistics from the 1 million veteran project, covering traits such as type 2 diabetes, blood pressure traits, lipids, and some disorders like uh, PTSD, alcohol use, and so on. So the following figure show again that LDAGBAT has the high power to detect significant gene in the first, in the second. Uh, bar. And more interesting, we, we looked at the number of genes that are detected only by one method, and exclusively by one method. And we, here in this, the second bar from the end, we see that the highest uh, number of genes, in average 67 detected genes, are detected by GVAT, whereas they are not detected by the classical GWAS or magma, for example. So in summary, we show that LDAG GBAT is well calibrated and it is robust to the choice of the reference panel. When using summary statistics data, we recommend for uh, using the human default heritability model, which is uh, the most performant and computationally efficient. And we demonstrated that LDAG GBAT was more powerful than GWAS or other gene-based method in terms of detecting new gene phenotype association, and it is computation efficient. And that brings us to the end, and I'd like to thank all my co-authors, especially Doug Speed, who uh, gave me this project, and the funding orgasm and you for your interest in my presentation. Please feel free to ask any question you might have and uh, thank you. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, uh, in your human default model, I'm, I'm sure I've asked Doug this before, but what, what is the basis for the, the power of 0.75 uh, is it just sort of you tried out different values? Uh, it's uh, it's from uh, the previous uh, work uh, on heritability models, and uh, in average, when uh, analyzing many traits from Yucca Biobank and other, like in average, the alpha when setting to 0 0.20, uh, 0.25, it gives the highest uh, likelihood for, for fitting to, to the model for the heritability. Is it too much work to include that as a free parameter in your models? Is it, it does it become too complicated to try and max? Yeah, it's uh, it's a parameter uh, reflecting the select the selection. 
So there is uh, like uh, the, the contribution of the minor uh, alert frequency to the heritability, it can vary uh, like to trait. So the best parameter to fit this, uh, it would be like uh, 0 0.25. Uh, thank you very much. That was really, really good. Um, so I was thinking about the fact, I, I, maybe this is debatable, I feel it, it would be unlikely that we wouldn't end up running the single variant tests in any case. So a kind of regular GWAS alongside gene-based tests. I wonder if you've thought about how the approach might be applied in parallel with just single variant testing as well. Because one could imagine, for example, an alpha splitting approach. So say you run the gene-based analysis, control and family-wise error at 0 0.025, and then the, the regular GWAS control it at 0 0.025, or wondering if that's something you've thought about. Um, yeah, very good question. And um, I think if I get it right, like uh, for gene that we, we don't have like too many SNPs that uh, included, uh, in the gene, one of the uh, the solution it will be using imp imputed data, for example, to increase the number of uh, covered SNPs, and uh, by mean like increasing like uh, the likelihood of uh, the estimation, for example. Um, yeah, I, I mean, just to be clear, I suppose the motivation would be that possibly some signals might not might be a little bit lost in the kind of composite genes tests yeah it, it, by definition like uh, because a gene it's a window but like the method it's uh, it can be extended to different definition of the window like uh, because like for example if we are just uh, excluding like uh, all region like outside the gene but we can use a different definition like uh, just using chunks of snips instead of using gene window definition Sorry about that. Fabian, could you please unmute and ask your question? Okay, I can read it out. Um, he said, I have probably missed something, but how, um, but how is your LRT work and with, sorry, but how your LRT work with binary traits? Sorry, does that make sense? I'm not sure. Yeah, there is some binary traits. So we tested also like uh, the impact, for example, by instead of using like uh, the linear uh, regression model and uh, like to use the prevalence when it's a binary, binary trait and it gives us the same power like of detection, like uh, no matter like uh, the type of the trait, if it is continuous or binary. Um, and Zoltan has a hand raised. Zoltan, would you like to unmute and say your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I was wondering when you compared for real trades, uh, you showed that you have more discovery with your method, but how much does the ranking change of your genes? So is there really just a, an increased power, but the order remains the same? Or do you actually swap orders in genes in their priority? Can you repeat, please, the question? So the question is about the real data application. When you have the ranking established by your method, how similar is it to the ranking of other methods? Um, uh, like, you mean how, uh, how many common uh, genes detected by uh, all the methods? Yes, for example, if you take top 100 genes by your method, by another method, how much would be the overlap to have you looked into this? Uh, 
Yeah, it's uh, presented like uh, when using like uh, the MVP traits, uh, like the fourth bar, it's uh, the common uh, number of uh, gene detected by all, for example, by the GWAS and MAGMA and GBAT. And uh, here, what I am showing at the end, it's uh, the number of gene detected exclusively by each approach, like here, the GWAS and the... Uh, ah. Uh, like, I refer to the fact of the when you say detection, it's based on a p-value threshold. But if you don't care about the p-value threshold, you just take the top hundred genes. How different would that list be? Sorry. So if you rank the based on your method, the top gene, top one hundred genes, how would the ranking be? Say with another method, would you support the top ranking? Uh, 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 we didn't do this but yeah maybe yeah i i, I think uh, it's a, a good check to 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 apply like to see like uh, how uh, like how it will be like the the detected uh, excess of gene like uh, by the other method if it's it is like increase in power or just uh, like we are detecting like uh, new new association outside the, like uh, the range yeah yeah Thank you for this suggestion. Thanks. Um, thanks. It's a great talk. Um, just say it's really impressive that the methods are so well calibrated against each other because um, I remember 10 years ago that the, the type 1 errors on these things was enormous or enormous. Um, but the, um, the thing is that um, the next step is pathway analysis and many for many for several of these approaches anyway have you tried doing pathway analysis with this and if so what do you uh, for do the meta analysis or pathway but by uh, pathway, by yeah. pathway analysis, I, I think, analysis. yeah i think for the pathway analysis uh, it i think for all the methods that just using like uh, result from gene analysis to uh, apply a pathway analysis. So maybe it will be like interesting, like to use, for example, a result based on the heritable estimation from enrichment, for example, as uh, a pathway analysis based of uh, association tests, instead of just combining like a, a P value from gene to, to, uh, to apply a pathway analysis. I think, yeah, it's a good. Uh, are, you, are you going to do that? Are you uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of, <laughs> of the future direction that we, we think uh, of, uh, of it, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Th thank you. Thank you.